Well, friends, I've changed rooms again. Now, some of you might be asking, but John, is this really a room? Could this really be considered a room? See, I thought to myself, how could I, in good conscience, be sitting pent up in a room on a day like this? The wonder of spring is on us, the flowers are out, and the grove is full of bird song. So no, I could not, in good conscience, be sitting in a room and recording this. Particularly because my subject today is directly related to where I am presently sitting. See, I want to talk a little bit today about technology. I want to talk about the natural world. I want to talk about our relationship to technology and what it is we risk losing when we are too immersed in our technological world and too little immersed in the world that actually stands around us. And I couldn't think of a better place to do this than where I'm sitting right now. This comes with disadvantages to you, my dear viewers, because you are going to have to put up with my ducks and you're going to have to put up with my roosters and with the bird song that is surrounding me at present. I cannot apologize for these things because I'm not their master. I can, however, apologize for the stubbornness which actually made me decide to do this. I'm sorry for that. But I think that any of you who actually follow me will understand by now that you're going to have to put up with some of my quirkiness along the way, so I'll just assume that you're in it for that as well. Now, there's a lot to be said about technology, and a lot that's already being said, much more competently probably than I could. There is a plethora of scientific studies now which indicate some of the more particularized dangers of our technology for us on the level of our behavior, on the level of our psychology and things of that kind. That's ground I'm not going to cover. I want to try to talk about some things that maybe are not so often spoken of. I'm sure that somewhere in the broad reaches of the internet, somebody's talking about them, but I haven't found them yet. And so I, I presume that they're a little bit rarer than some of the other um, more evident concerns and questions about our relationship to technology. And I want to begin, yet again, by pointing to the illusion of the video that you are watching. You see, we human beings are structured to be standing in front of one another. We have minds, we have bodies that react to physical presence. And they do so in any number of very, very subtle ways that are completely beyond our awareness, and in many cases, perhaps even our understanding. We're simply built to be around other human beings. We're social animals. So when you are sitting in front of a computer and you see a video of a human being who is speaking directly to you, your mind immediately interprets this as being an interpersonal relationship. And that gives me a great deal of potential power, because at present, I am in your phone. I am in your computer. I may be in your house. To your unconscious mind, our relationship might have reached such a level of intimacy that I could be in your kitchen or even in your bedroom. Now, of course, I'm not actually in your house. Okay, this got a little weird. Let's just step back. Let's start over. The point of all this is that when you begin to follow somebody online, you begin to watch a lot of their videos, you get a sense of their character, their personality, or at least that which they decide to present to you through these videos. It's very easy to develop a trust for that human being. This is a normal thing, and I think that it's actually a very fruitful and interesting part of our internet connection. The point is this. I am in a different time than you are. I am on possibly a different continent. And yet, we have the power to imagine ourselves in a much more close proximity. We could potentially get on a phone call this very afternoon and speak to each other real time, notwithstanding the great distances that separate us. This is part and parcel of technology. Technology is a power-giving structure. It is based on science, which is a power epistemology, and it is dedicated to bringing us greater levels of power in the world. I want to talk about what this does to us psychologically. You see, human beings in the past were largely at the mercy of the conditions that surrounded. If there was a drought, there was a famine. If there was a storm, it could ruin crops and kill animals. If there was an earthquake or a volcano, it could bury entire cities. Some of this is true to this day, but we have managed to escape from these constraints. We've managed to extricate ourselves from these necessities of the natural world to such an extent that it's very easy for us to persuade ourselves that we're immune to these disasters. We forget about our human contingency. We're able to do incredible things. We're able to speak to one another across vast distances. We're able to immortalize moments and photographs and videos. We're able to cure diseases that in the past would have meant certain death. If it's cold outside, we turn our heating on. If it's hot outside, we turn our cooling on. I can get in my car and in a very brief period of time, I can cover very, very long distances. If I want to, tomorrow I can get into the belly of an enormous bird and I can fly. Now consider all of this. Think about all of this. These are shocking things. They give us superpowers. And we're only the beginning of the most recent revolution. With the advent of artificial intelligence and all of the various things that it brings into our lives, we now have more information at our disposal than ever before. 
our human memories, although they become corrupted and weak, can rely on artificial helpmeets to provide the information for them that they no longer have to provide themselves. Our very imaginations now have this tremendous crutch in things like automatic image production and automatic video production, music production, voice production. At the click of a button or the pull of a trigger, I can kill a man. There are individuals who, at the click of a button, can destroy entire cities. This is incredible power, and it is inevitable that in some ways it's going to alter our perception of our lives and of the world. To say it again, we no longer recognize our contingency as human beings, our limitations. We're liable even to forget our mortality. There's that old bromide that every man knows he's going to die, but I would contest this very hotly, as a matter of fact. I don't believe that most people do know that they're going to die, at least not most of the time. I think that we all very much forget that we're destined for the grave. We're able to forget it. We can set all of that aside. We find sophisticated ways of taking dying and death and putting it into parts of our world that we don't actually have to look at directly. Once was the case that if somebody died in your family, he was going to be dying in your household and you would have to take care of it. You would be there every step of the way, from the moment of sickness to the moment of demise. You would have to take care of the corpse, to see to tying up all of the loose ends. Now we have outsourced death and dying to the class of doctors and to the medical field and to a whole host of professionals who are dedicated to obscuring all of these uncomfortable truths from our vision and hiding them to our awareness. It's becoming more and more common for people to die alone in hospital rooms, distant from their houses and their families. And certainly once that happens, you don't have to do anything about it. You don't have to take care of the body. You don't have to even see the body until it's been nicely prepared by the embalmer. We're living in a state of continual denial. Continual denial also about our debility as human beings, our basic weakness. All right, so you're probably wondering, John, did you pull me out into this forest just to talk to me about dying and death? That's right, friend. You will die. Okay. All right, so I'm sorry. Look, what I want more than anything else is for us all to recognize that we are not limitless. The powers of our technology very often grant us this kind of implicit sense of our power. And we need to be fighting that continually. Like, honestly, I am not a fire-producing warlock because I can flip a switch and my heater turns on. I do not have magical powers over the darkness simply because the lights in my home keep it at bay. I, you, and everyone you know is still a human being. And we human beings are frail and small, and all the more precious for it. There's at present a transhumanist attempt well underway to try to make human beings immortal, to divinize them in the worst of all possible ways, to take our small and imperfect humanity and to aggrandize it to a cosmic scale. And I wonder that the nightmare of this can't easily be perceived when we can't even keep peace in our own households or understand how to work our communities in a reasonable and sane way. How are we ever going to become gods over the cosmos? But this hubris, this arrogance is part and parcel of our day-to-day -day lives. And that's what I want to point out now. It's very easy for us to look at the past with a degree of contempt. We look at these poor sods in the past who had to walk wherever they went or had to use animals in order to sow or or harvest their crops. These people were at the mercy of hunger and disease. If they were born into ignorant families, they likely remained ignorant until the day they died, and there was no remedy for it. Many didn't have books in their homes, not to speak of handheld encyclopedias. They couldn't move about with any degree of liberty. They couldn't buy food from the supermarket. And look at us in our abundance, our spectacular abundance. Now, I am as grateful as the next man for all of the goods that our technology and our science has brought to us, and I am well cognizant of them. But part of being well cognizant of a thing means also knowing its limitations. And this is most of what our scientific age has forgotten. There's a definite tendency to assume that because science has been so magnificently successful in certain parts of our human life, it's only a matter of time before that same success makes itself felt in all of the aspects of our human life. This is the attitude known as scientism, and it is one of the great diseases of our times. But there is no guarantee that simply because science can understand a certain segment of the universe, it can understand the entirety of the universe. There is no guarantee that because science has power over one thing, it will have power over all things. And there is no guarantee that our technology, simply because it is able to keep certain human illnesses at bay, will one day be able to eradicate all evils. To the contrary, as I pointed out in my last video, we are actually seeing a moment in which it seems that science is coming up hard against its own limitation. But we have not internalized this experience, and that's the point. We are still living in the world of science, the world that science has built for us. I go outside and I take my phone with me. I carry these things in my pocket, and it's part of my constant comprehension of the world. It integrates itself into my understanding. There is such danger in this, and I think that it behooves us all to very seriously consider the ways in which science and its fruits have altered our perception of things.
and act against that. I mean, there's this saying online, go out and touch grass. But what does that really mean? I mean, it means get back to the natural world, the organic world. Because one of the things about science, one of the things about technology that inevitably changes us is the degree and the way in which it is structured. It is built to a human logic, into a very specific kind of human logic, and it understands all things through that lens. To the degree to which we see the world through the filter of our technology, the world is being filtered through that very same kind of very limited rationality. This is the binary logic of programming, of the algorithm, and it is capable of tyrannizing over our minds. There is something devastating, profoundly devastating, in our constant will to substitute movies, films, television series, or video games for actual experience in the world. I'm not standing on a soapbox here. I am as subject to this as the next man. I am presently sitting in an olive grove, very paradoxically speaking to a camera. Yes, I haven't forgot that I'm speaking to a camera. I never forget that I'm speaking to a camera. It's always looking at me with its cycloptic eye. What was the name of that machine? Hal? I always expect that it's going to begin speaking to me in that kind of, you know, soft, calm, terrifying voice. Everything is well, John. Look into the camera, John. That was probably a bad impression. I haven't seen that film in years. Um, not that much of a Kubrick fan. Some of his stuff's okay. I mean, that video that he made to fake the moon landing, that was, that was top-notch. Really good stuff. Tongue-in-cheek, everybody. Tongue-in-cheek. Don't come down on me, YouTube censors. Just joking. Just joking. Or was I? But this brings me to another very important point. All right, now, all the business about whether the moon landing was faked or not aside, there is something very interesting in the fact that it is actually possible to believe such a thing in our time. All of us have seen the videos, and yet some of us don't believe them. And in and of itself, there is nothing illegitimate in this. It is conceivable that somebody could artifice a video about a fake event and show it to the public. In fact, we know that this happens. It's been happening for a long time now. Not, of course, that our country would ever do such a thing. No, never would it do such a thing. Not our country. But other countries, the bad ones. And again, with advances in artificial intelligence, with advances in so-called deep fake technologies, all of this becomes even more powerful and even more possible. We're living in a time when it is not only reasonable, but even advisable to take everything that we see with a grain of salt. Imagine what this does for a moment to your mind. Imagine on the one hand, the mentality of a human being who decides that he's not going to pay any attention to this because it's just way too overwhelming to think about. And so begins to trust everything with an even greater degree of intensity. Or on the other hand, the human being who realizes that this is a true and real problem and that it really demands a great deal of attention. It begins to fixate on this question to the point that he can no longer trust anything that he sees. Whichever way you decide to go with this, it's going to have deep effects on your relationship to the world and to society. We're dealing with layers upon layers of fundamentally new kinds of human problems. Our ancestors never had to deal with any of this. Did their governments lie? Of course they did. Were there propaganda wars being waged? Continually. But they could trust their eyes, and they could trust eyewitness testimony. You go back to the original historians, people like Thucydides and Herodotus. And what were they doing? They were going around and asking human beings about what they had seen, or else they were reporting what they themselves had seen. There was this fundamental distinction between rumor on the one hand, hearsay, and eyewitness testimony on the other. That distinction holds in our day as well, but it has been so fundamentally complicated by the advent of video and streaming technologies that it's no longer very easy to differentiate between the one and the other. Eyewitness testimony has become a kind of hearsay, and that is such a fundamental change, it's such an enormous shift, that we're only beginning to see the byproducts of it. We have taken human categories of understanding the world, and we have melded them together. And unfortunately, not for the better. I mean, it would be one thing if we had some way of making hearsay become eyewitness testimony, but we've made eyewitness testimony become hearsay, which means that we have problematized very, very deeply our relation to the truth. A similar and related problem to this is the problem of psychological transmissions or subliminal messaging or things of this kind. It is well known that advertising companies make enormous amounts of money. It is well known that any large organization, any large company, particularly a multinational, is going to be spending absurd amounts of money to people who can predict human psychology and manipulate it. There are classes of experts that have grown up around these industries particularly. Whenever we watch television or see an advertisement on YouTube, whenever we watch any video put out by somebody who has a lot of financial clout, we can be sure that somebody is trying to pull something over on us. And the way in which this is done is not always clear because it is very, very subtle. It already says a great deal that we of today can look back at the propaganda of, say, the 
1930s or 40s or that period during the Second World War. And to us, it just appears ham-fisted and crude. We can see right through it. And it's amazing to think that people would have fallen for such things. But it was the state of the art at that time. And just as the people of that era had difficulty seeing through the propaganda of their day, we have difficulty seeing through the propaganda of ours. These are all skills that can be learned. I think that they are instincts that can be honed and must be honed. To begin with, we have to get very, very good at differentiating between real human beings and artificially produced ones. We have to learn to trust our intuition about the manipulations that come through things like advertisement and political campaigns. And we have to do all of this without becoming mistrustful toward the world itself. Now, some of us in consequence of this, I think, will have a tendency to just simply want to retire from the world, to get out of this huge mess, and to set aside these problems altogether by ignoring them. This is the route I almost took when I almost became a Luddite, never told the story, but you know the story. It seemed like an Alexandrian solution to the Gordian knot, no? This knot is just too complicated to unravel, so I'm going to cut straight through it by buying a family cow. Don't you see the elegance of it? Don't you see the beauty? But of course it's not adequate. It's not adequate. We live in this world, and this world will find us. You cannot hide from it forever. Even beyond that, as I've said before, technology comes with such gifts that it seems almost insane to ignore or deny them. The very same internet and social media which have such a devastating effect on social relationships also open up possibilities to true friendships and true relationships. We're called upon to be warriors in this highly technological and sophisticated world, but we are called upon to be warriors who really need the wisdom of the serpent. You cannot force your way through this. You cannot blunder your way through these problems. Hack and slash is not an option here. What's needed is vigilance and awareness and a constant realization of where we stand vis-a-vis -vis our technology, and with relationship to one another. Now, I'm presently engaged in a kind of experiment, and I'd like to invite you all to join me in this experiment, either by doing something the same personally or just watching me as my disaster slowly unfolds. Sounds fun, huh? Sounds great. Why don't you subscribe to my channel? You should subscribe to my channel. There are good times ahead. It's down there. It's just a little button. I don't know what it looks like. Um, it's not the bell. I don't think it's the bell. There's a button down there, though. You can find it. It might be a word. It's a word. Subscribe. <laughs> Now, see, this is an example of what I'm talking about. This is first-rate advertising. Do you see the way that I just manipulated you there? Could you see through that? You've got to be aware of this at all times. People are going to get you otherwise. There are people who pay lots of money for these things. Okay. Where was I? Ah, experiment. My experiment. Yes. So I want to know, is it possible to live in a reasonable way and at the same time have any kind of success on the social media? I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm interested in being successful on the social media. I have things that ride on it, such as the future of my new serial novel, <clears throat> which is out now, by the way. It's um, There's a link in the description, um, just so you know. <laughs> Did you know that this is just a 30-minute long advertisement? That's all this is. I was paid to do this by myself. But really, I mean, I want to know, is it possible to actually take time away every day to go out into the natural world and to read a book, to spend time with my animals, for instance, to simply look at the flowers, to enjoy the spring? To do all of these things, and at the same time, at the same time, to feed the algorithm sufficiently that the algorithm will support me in my efforts. Can you grow on the social media without giving all of your time to the social media? Are these things monsters that feed on our blood? That's my experiment. That's what I want to find out. Let's be scientific about this, shall we? I'll go write up a plan and we'll see to it. We'll do it methodically. But I was thinking about this this morning, okay, because I came outside when I probably should have been working on any of my various projects. You know, nose to the grindstone and all that. Can't keep up if you're not willing to sell your entire life to it like Andrew Tate. And instead of hitting the grind, I went and I sat in my olive grove. And I was looking at the world just after sunrise, and the light in the wood sorrel, and the strands of the spider webs from the newborn spiders that was festooning the grove. Lines of light that are so fine that my camera cannot detect them. And the life around me, the stirring of life that's coming back into the world after this winter. All of the insects that play in the flowers, the birds in the trees. There is a living soil underneath our feet which is filled with untold numbers of animals and insects and, and microscopic organisms. And that literally feeds us day by day because it's thanks to that life that the food that we put on our plates is able to come into the world. I was looking at all of this, just the marvelous variety of this extraordinary feast that surrounds us. And do you know that in a year's time, I'm not going to remember any specific day that I sat down to the grind, but I will probably remember this morning. Part of that is because of its uniqueness. I don't usually go out at that time of the day to spend so much time out of my olive grove. Maybe I should. Maybe there's something to be said to 
limiting such beauty because it becomes that much more potent when you actually experience it. But I also think that there's something to be said with simply keeping our feet on the ground, recalling to ourselves what it means to be alive, recalling to ourselves at the same time that as I'm looking out at this spectacular beauty that surrounds me. There are also horrors unfolding there in the underground. It is impossible to calculate how many animals are being eaten underneath my chair, torn to pieces by ravenous monsters that dig through the earth. Fun thoughts, yes, fun thoughts. <laughs> but this is exactly what I mean. These are the realities that you cannot escape if you live in the natural world. You will see things being killed and being eaten and dying. Any farmer knows this. An essential part of being a farmer is living daily with death. And an essential part of being a farmer is every day seeing life come from that death. There's nothing cyclical about technology. And this is one of the things that drives me crazy about it. It is so linear. It is so remarkably linear. The closest thing you see to a curve is the line of progress as it accelerates. But there are no cycles to it. It is built to break free of cycles. But our lives are built on cycles. We are cyclical beings. From the cycle of the earth and the sun, the cycle of the year and the seasons, down to the cycle of the day, down to the cycle of our very heartbeat. We are cyclical beings. And to the extent to which we break ourselves free of that cycle, we become robotic beings. We transform into something else. We become a function of our technology. And the wild thing about this is that our technology is supposed to be a function of our lives. So we are transforming ourselves into a function of a function. And we don't even see it happening as it happens. That's the danger. It's the insidiousness of it. The degree to which it sneaks up on you. So what can we do about this? Well, I think that there are some simple remedies in things like touching grass, yes, but also in recalling the cyclical quality of our lives, insisting on it. Right? Don't be one of those people who tries to skip meals by drinking a milkshake. Insist on the meal. Sit down at the meal. Go with your family and sit at the table for that meal. Turn your television off. Throw your phone out the window. I mean, okay, maybe not out the window. It depends. If you're on the ground floor, throw it out the window. You can get it later. If you're higher up, depends on how much money you have. But really, put these things aside and sit down at the table half an hour with your family. Be a human being. There is time for all the rest. And if there is not time for all the rest, then something has to change in our lives. We cannot be the slaves of this technological reality, not without losing our humanity. Insist on meals, insist on feasts and holidays. One of the things that I adore about the Orthodox Church, of which I am a part, is its insistence on the liturgical year. This includes things like fast times and feast times. It includes major holidays. It includes lesser holidays. It integrates our human life into a series of rhythms, into a series of unfolding time, which is punctuated by these moments. This is how we become human again. Pay attention to when technology is forcing you to live linearly and break free of it. I mean, it's a simple thing that I did today, just coming out here to sit to record this video. I don't imagine it's garnered me much. It might have some horrible ramifications that I'm not even aware of for the uh, video quality and things like that. But it breaks me out of this kind of linearity which is being produced by this schedule that I've developed. Now, the schedule itself has a kind of rhythm, yes, but it's a rhythm which is always attempting to become more efficient and more perfect. But true efficiency is living organically in relation to circumstance. It's being willing to change your schedule because your neighbor is at the fence and you need to go talk to him for about half an hour about absolutely nothing whatsoever. It's willing to stop working because there's a friend who's at your door who needs to talk to you about something or who wants to talk to you about something. It does not feel constrained to put your nose to the grindstone up until the point where you don't have a nose anymore and you're just this kind of faceless thing walking through the world with your face ground off. I wonder if I'm going to leave that in here. We'll see. This is what I mean by being a warrior, by being a vigilant warrior in the world. Use technology for the good things that it provides. I'm able to spread this message to all of you and I hope sincerely that you will consider leaving me comments about what you think about this so that I can interact with you as a human being. Because that's another way in which we can break free of the linearity of our technology. Human contact. We have to understand that we are in a battle with our technology to the extent that we use it for its good. It has good. Everyone can see the good things that technology does. I don't need to dwell on those. But to say it again, technology is structured to definite purposes. It is not a neutral thing. It's not like a knife that you can use to cut butter or to stab somebody. It's more like a military knife, which is made for stabbing people. That's unfair to military knives. I like military knives. Don't get on my case about the military knife. My point is that technology is built in order to restructure our minds in very definite ways, and we've got to be aware of this if we're going to use it, or at least if we're going to use it responsibly and humanely. There's something curious about technology which is commented on very frequently, that it tends to integrate itself into our lives over time. So the newest technology is always something that only a few people are going to use. Those few people pass it on to a larger segment of the population until finally the thing becomes very generalized and even universal. 
consider the smartphone, for example. Up until this summer, I was the only person I know who didn't have one. Now I have one too, which means I know nobody who doesn't have one of these things. And that is absolutely incredible. It is remarkable to think that everybody under the sun owns one of these little devices. Something similar is bound to happen with the newest artificial intelligence. Now I have made a firm declaration against the newest artificial intelligence. I recognize that the lines between the older forms of technology and the newer forms of technology are not so perfectly clean that a declaration like this can be easily maintained. And I know as well that in 10 years time, that technology is going to be so prevalent around me that I'm going to be forced to use it to some extent as well. These are inevitabilities of our situation. Only a very ingenuous person would think otherwise. The question is not in the implementation of the technology, but in the manner of the implementation of the technology. How we use these things. With what degree of awareness. And there may well come a time in which we all have to simply say, no, I'm not going to go that next step. I'm not going to use that next device. I'm not going to let you plant a microchip in my brain. Elon Musk, I'm talking to you, Elon Musk. Would you leave the monkeys alone? We have to have firm limits at some point or another, or else we're simply going to just devolve into this horrifying state of inhumanity melded with technology. And only a technocrat could think that that would be a good thing. Now, for anyone who sees the scope of this problem, I think that it's very easy to become hopeless at times. And I honestly believe that the way of considering this rightly is to think about the conditions that would be necessary for all of this technology to be used wisely. Given that there's no way of stopping technological progress, and given that there's no way of escaping from it, the only thing that we can do is throw ourselves once again back on our fundamental humanity. The only revolution which is ever going to change the course of our society is a revolution which happens not on the level of governments, but on the level of the human soul. Sitting down and eating lunch with your family without any electronic devices being present is a revolutionary act. It is part of the reason the family is being so hotly contested in this particular historical moment, part of the reason it is being so continuously attacked. Going to church every Sunday is a revolutionary act. Professing your faith is a revolutionary act. Stepping outside every now and then when you should be working and instead going out to sit in the forest is a revolutionary act. Reading old books instead of new newspaper articles is a revolutionary act. Putting your phone in your pocket every time you sit down to have coffee with a friend and not taking it out for any reason at all, even to settle bets between friends, is a revolutionary act. Continuing to try to memorize things rather than relying continuously on the applications in your smartphone is a revolutionary act. Going for a walk instead of playing a video game or praying instead of scrolling the social media is a revolutionary act. And it is the cumulative effort that we put into these small acts of rebellion that is going to determine the course of our future and whether we will succeed in seeing a new flourishing of a brilliant new kind of society or a total and utter decline of our humanity into the dregs of a terrifying technocratic superstate. And I do believe this to the bottom of my heart. It's possible that human beings have only ever had these two choices, but today these two choices are more prevalent than ever and more is riding on them than ever. We have a choice between human freedom and total slavery. There is no alternative. And anything that seems to fall in the middle will soon go one way or the other. It will be strained through the alembic of our days, and we will see its true quality in not so very long. So that might seem all very dire and depressing, but in point of fact, it's not. Because the one thing that's always been within our power to maintain is our own level of human freedom. The one thing that we have control over in this world is our degree of freedom. Human freedom is conditional upon absolutely nothing in the world. If it is cultivated rightly, if it is protected well within the human soul, nothing can take it away from you. You could be rotting in the coldest, dampest prison cell in Siberia, and you would still have that freedom. Then think of us in our absolutely incredible situation where we have a degree of material wealth which is unprecedented in all of the epics of human existence. Think of us with all of the potentiality that we have riding on our fingertips, what that freedom could mean and could do. That's my simple message to you. Be human beings. Be free. Insist upon your freedom in every way that you can. And together, let's see if we can't make this common future of ours into something bright and good. I'll be doing my part with my little experiment here. It's very scientific, a very scientific experiment. Thoroughly scientific. And you can do your part by leaving a like and subscribing to this channel. Show the man! Subscribe to my channel. Really, I do hope that you've gotten something out of this very rambling discourse. This is another Montaigne style uh, video. I hope that these are coming out all right. I can never be sure because nobody ever leaves me any comments. <laughs> right. Don't mean to get petulant, but really, whether or not you decide to leave comments, I'm 
very sincerely grateful for your presence here. I, I want to thank you for being with me all the way up until the end of this lengthy tirade. For a number of reasons, I've insisted very much on pointing out the distance and the separation between me and my viewers. But having said that, since you evidently haven't been alienated by that and you've made it this far, I do also want to say that there is a real kind of connection in these videos. This is a real kind of relationship. There is something sincere and authentic about this, and I know because I've had the same relationship on the other side where I've watched people making videos and I've gotten something from what they've done. Otherwise, I wouldn't be inspired to do this myself. So presuming that you have gotten anything at all from my ranting uh, means a lot to me. And the fact that I'm saying that here at the end where it couldn't possibly have any consequences for any of the uh, algorithmic parts of this video, I think at least somewhat corroborates my sincerity. What do you think? Has it all just been an advertisement? I mean, not all of it. Parts of it, maybe. Parts of it. All right, so with that, thanks so much and farewell to you all.